Our guest tonight is Fernando Gallegos. He's an author and a documentary filmmaker, and his book, The Ancients, Investigations into the Lost Civilizations of Lemuria and Atlantis, is available on Amazon. You can find him at propheticmystic.com, and his upcoming documentary is Civilization X. We hope you enjoy the interview. Joining us on the show today for the very first time is Fernando Gallegos. How are you today, Fernando? Just fine, just fine. It's a pleasure to have you on. And we were quite intrigued because you got in touch with us to initially tell us about your trip to South America. And you've made multiple trips. Uh, And we also finished reading your book, The Ancients, Investigations into the Lost Civilizations of Lemuria and Atlantis. Now, this interview is perfect timing because I was saying to you before the show, All we've been speaking about lately is ventures into the Amazon and- Lost cities, civilizations. we've been talking about shamanism and and the great culture from South America. And now we get a chance to talk to you about your trips. But first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got so interested in ancient myths and legends. I guess as a little kid, uh, all the other kids would be reading books like uh, comic books and things of that sort. And I'll just be off in my own little corner reading about lost civilizations, ghosts, uh, mysticism especially. Yeah, you just described and, my childhood as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I was kind of dubbed the weird one. You know, I had several experiences growing up, you know, that kind of pushed me further into like an unknown realm, you know. Okay. And so I, I wanted to read up more and more, uh, to try to figure out why... I saw or experienced those things. Yeah, you described in the book, The Ancients, how you had this drawer just full of information that you'd collected over the years. And going through the book, it really felt like it was your, I guess, ultimate collection and, you know, the ideas that have formed through years of research. Uh, But tell us about your first trip to South America in 2008. How did that come about and what did you discover? Okay, so that was part of with the university. A teacher went up to me and asked if I would be willing to go with her and a few of her students to go study a lost tribe, what was once considered a lost tribe. Uh, they were discovered in the 1950s. And according to legend, when the Spanish conquistadors conquered Cusco, um, the high priest with all the secret traditions and teachings, they fled into the mountains never to be seen or heard from again. And so it wasn't until the 1950s that an anthropologist started digging around the highlands and actually discovered a group that still preserved these mystical teachings intact, exactly the way as the way the Inca originally did. And so we went to go study with them and uh, to become initiated among them and to learn their different um, healing ceremonies, uh, rituals, and things of that sort. So it was quite an experience. You actually got initiated into the tribe. What did that entail? It was just a quick little, uh, what they call a despacho. So it's basically like an offering. They get different coca leaves, different uh, candies, and they make an offering to the Mother Earth. And whatever you put into it gets basically brought into the ether, I should say. Okay. And and it's basically like an offering. So you got off pretty easy. It wasn't like you got locked in a cave for nine months, circumcised, and then (laughs) released into the wild. What were there, some of their ancient myths and legends that tied into, you know, the the myths and legends of Lemuria and Atlantis. Did you find any connections? There were no connections. I tried to pursue it as much as I could with them, but they really were hesitant to reveal too much. Um, I don't know if it's because over there things are more simple. They don't really go in depth in terms of their history, yeah. but um, I tried to pursue it as much as I could, but I couldn't get much out of them. We found that the case with our recent research that a, a lot of explorers had that trouble with the natives that it took a long time for them to be trusted. And we even found with uh, botanists researching plants in the Amazon, they were purposefully told the wrong information to kind of, you know, to throw off the white man to get the- Well, there was so much distrust. (laughs) Oh, yeah. There's a lot of distrust among the natives, uh, especially toward outsiders. I mean, they might warm up to you, but they still are quite hesitant because they see themselves as vulnerable. And they think that you're there just to take away from them. you know. I guess what we should start to talk about is Lemuria and Atlantis. You've been looking at these topics for years now. Well, you say you're obsessed with it. Yeah. Do you oh, yeah. think there's some truth to these legends and, and myths of ancient civilizations? Do you, have you found anything concrete that's made you firmly believe, yes, they existed in the past? 
Well, yes. I started reading on the books regarding Lemuria specifically back in 2003. Because I had access to ethnographies, archaeological research papers, I started digging deeper and deeper. And I started to realize that, wait a minute, there is a connection to actual physical evidence that is out there. And yet nobody's bringing it up. And so I, I became obsessed, especially when, when it came to um, DNA analysis. Like the most ancient of DNA in the Americas is not Native American. It's an unknown origin. And so that captured me. That captured me. And I became obsessed. Are there any hypotheses on what this DNA could be or where it's come from? A lot of scientists believe that it came from Beringia. It's a land bridge between Alaska and Russia that there once were, was possibly a land there. And they developed this, this uh, genetic mutation, which is haplock group X. And that, that in turn came down into the Americas. And for example, like the oldest skeletons found in the Americas, they had these Caucasian-like traits. And why is that? And so I started researching more about the DNA and stuff like that and the different other haplock groups that came later with the Native American populations. And tell us about the connection between those archaeological finds and Native American mythology. There seems to be a mention of an ancient race of people that preceded the Native Americans and they were sometimes referred to as having pale skin. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. A lot of the Native American legends mentioned these lost tribes that when the Native American tribes started coming into the Americas, there was already these isolated pockets of uh, these Caucasian-like individuals. And they were seen as almost like mystical in nature. They were seen very peaceful. There was no war among anybody. One of the biggest or most important ethnographies that I have read is about Lucy Thompson, which is a Yurok Native American from Northern California. And she says at one point in time, they got together and they left vowing to one day return. And so when the white settlers started coming in to the California region, they thought it was them returning. And so they easily were fooled into believing that and uh, they took advantage of them. Is that belief that these white people would return was that isolated to uh, North America or was it also extending through the cultures through the South? Everywhere, everywhere. Uh, South America, South America. The biggest thing was Viracocha. He was seen almost like Quetzalcoatl in, with the Mayans and the Aztec. He left into the setting sun vowing to one day return. And so it's quite a common theme among Native American populations. Well, the fact that all these stories are very similar, does that suggest that it could just come from a centralized uh, folklore or, or legend or that there actually was this particular location and it's just somehow spread out through these different cultures? I think there was, in fact, some, I should say, some Garden of Eden, some source for all this, all these legends. But when it comes to these actual tribes, um, there's too much evidence to suggest that there were there was just like one tribe or something. These are all independent accounts. And when I started analyzing the Native American stories, they all said that this homeland existed over the straits. At that time, the straits uh, between Alaska and Russia it was uh, like an ice corridor. And these Native American stories say that they crossed into the Americas via this corridor. And to the north of that is where the homeland was which is, would be the Arctic region, which at one point in time, fairly recently, used to be a tropical paradise. It's almost like the Garden of Eden story, but for the Native Americans. I love this story that the Incas hid a lot of their most valuable artifacts and information and, and just kind of hid it away into some secret city. Do you think there's any truth to that story? And do you think there's, I guess, the smoking gun waiting to be found? I do believe so. Uh, as soon as the conquistadors started invading Peru, all the gold, all this knowledge that they had, they basically wanted to save it from being destroyed. Even though the Inca didn't have a written language, they did use a lot of symbolism. So I believe that there is a lot of in-depth symbology hidden in plain sight. And so I think that there is a city in which still possesses all the ancient, uh, most sacred artifacts that they had. And I believe it's in the Amazonian jungle. And this is what you're going to find. Uh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> we'll hold you to that. Your first trip you described to us at the start of the interview in 2008, but you went back again in August last year 
And you're now working on a documentary called Civilization X. So I guess we should talk about this trip and the filming you did uh, in the region. Tell us what was your plan with this expedition? Well, my original intent was just to take my fiance on an expedition, uh, an adventure that she'll never forget. Okay. So it started with that premise and I decided to hit as many archaeological sites as we could and film as much as we could. And so we hit uh, we landed in La Paz, Bolivia. We went to Tiwanaku, Lake Titicaca. We started asking questions, um, investigating ourselves. It was, it was quite an adventure. But in the end of the trip, we ended up in the Amazonian jungle uh, for about a, a little over a week. And it was quite an experience. So what, what type of things did you experience and discover? Was it more of a, I guess, a cultural discovery? Or did you actually find any... Uh, you know, artifacts and ruins in the jungle. It was more of a cultural discovery. However, I got to meet this one gentleman whose name is also Fernando. Uh, he runs officially a tour group. On the side, he does expeditions, like hardcore expeditions. And he recently went into the jungle and actually discovered, along with another explorer from Spain, they actually discovered a huge rock wall. It's in the shape of a face, and it matches perfectly to the Paiatiti myth that once you cross this lake, there is a guardian, and beyond the guardian is the city. They've been trying the last year, I believe, to gather up cultural support, local support by the natives, to actually go further and explore and hopefully discover that city. It always sounds like a logistical problem. There's there's plenty of uh, you know anecdotal tales of people coming across these things, but then when it comes to actually getting the cost of putting an expedition together, that seems to be uh, the main hurdle. Oh, yeah. It's, and, and it's also very hush-hush because um, it's so sensitive. Even the people that are carrying, helping carry some of the gear, they could easily just go back and tell somebody else. And they could get paid off and boom, everything's just destroyed, ransacked. It, it happens all the time. And so that's why he was trying to get me to take up the project of continuing on this expedition further and further into the jungle to discover this lost city. Is that something that you want to plan in the future, that you would go on this expedition? That is my next goal. <laughs> but if I do it, I really want to go through the academic community because I don't want to risk putting such a site at risk for looting or any type of vandalism because that's really, really common. The best stories are when an explorer just happens to fall into a tunnel and then finds all this stuff. That's what you need to do. You need to fall oh, yeah. into a tunnel in the Amazon. <laughs> just find gold. <laughs> just be surrounded by jewels and mummies. I love that in your book you actually included some of those uh, wilder stories. Can you tell us the story of the Death Valley cavemen? Do you know that well enough to tell the story? Uh, not too well, but I could tell you as much as I can remember. Um there was a man who was working for a mining company and he stumbled into a cavern and he came across this tunnel and it led him to different buildings underground with uh, secret chambers and ever burning lights and st things of that sort. And the thing that was most curious about that is how he mentions these huge 10 foot tall mummies wearing Masonic aprons. And that's the thing that always sticks out with me. And it's almost like the Inca walls it's very precise stone cut with um, niches. And inside each niche, according to him, were remains of almost like dinosaurs. So it kind of throws off, you know, okay. But for a while, the Smithsonian was pursuing his, uh, his story. Yeah, they were offering millions of dollars for the location of the site, right? And what and happened? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he ran off and that was it. Um, <laughs> there was see, that takes away some of the validity <laughs> of the story, That's doesn't it? how those stories always end. You see, there's a great tale of falling into this cavern and the walls are all polished smooth and then they find all these incredible things and then when they finally have the day where they're going to show other people the canyon, they mysteriously disappear. Now, the conspiracy theories are that the Smithsonian assassinated them and I'm just going to think that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with that. But I think for him specifically, he actually went on to help preserve one of the archaeological sites in uh, New Mexico. Oh, uh, wow. So, so he actually went on to actually pursue a little bit more of archaeological uh, preservation. Through a portal he found in this cave? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's also the stories you talk about J.C. Brown. That kind of links up as well. Do you recall what you wrote about J.C. Brown? Yes, yes. So, in 1904, um, he was working for the mining company based out of uh, England, I believe. 
And he was in Northern California in Mount Shasta. And he stumbled into the cave and to a cavern, which Mount Shasta is infamous for, these underground shafts that go on forever. So he started going, according to him, it was about uh, 11 miles into one of these tunnel systems where he came across this remnants of a town, like a city. Of course, nobody was there. And he again mentioned, like the previous story, these tall mummies, these tall skeletons. Um, he claims to have started writing as much as he could, like of these hieroglyphs and all these like swords, uh, shields, things of that sort. So he started recording this in his a journal. And after he left, for the next 30 years, he tried to find enough evidence to figure out what it was that he came across. And so he came to the conclusion that it was part of the Lemurian culture that once existed. And yeah, he spent the next few years trying to round up people, trying to round up support to go investigate this cave that he supposedly found that was also filled with gold. And on the day they were supposed to embark into the cavern, he disappeared. Some people think <laughs> yeah. that he swindled everybody out of their money. That in reality, he didn't get a dime from anybody, but he just mysteriously vanished. And the Stockton police and a bunch of other police forces tried to figure out what had happened to him, and they couldn't find any remnant of him. I love this idea that there were survivors of the destruction of Lemuria, and they set up colonies around the planet, but somehow persist to today. And that's where we have these tales from Mount Shasta. Flying ships. Yeah, that link that's linked with UFOs and there's strange stories of, you know, men wearing pure white robes descending from the mountain and asking for strange requests at the local stores. Do you think there's any credence to these tales? Do you think there's anything to this or is it just urban legend? Uh, I think for me... Um, the Native American legends said it best. You know, these people look this certain way and these recent tales, which are completely independent of the Native American legends, they say almost exactly the same thing. The Native Americans say that they left, they disappeared back where once they came. However, these independent reports, these people, as crazy as they may sound, mention and describe these people being almost exactly the same. And so it's almost as if maybe the Lemurians didn't ever really leave. Instead, they hid away into the mountains or wherever. But what are some of these legends? Because isn't it being claimed that they're coming down from the hills and paying for items in gold coins or in gold? Yeah, again, these are just uh, stories. Um, there's no way of actually knowing if there's any truth behind it. But again, it sounds almost exactly this, as if the old Native American legends are true. You yeah. Know? The, the most bizarre one I heard was that there was a delegation of three of these strangers who descended from Mount Shasta wearing their white robes and they were barefoot and they walked to San Francisco. That is correct. To say <laughs> hi to the mayor. <laughs> what? <laughs> yep. Surely there'd be some record of that. I tried digging as deep as I could with that one, I could not find anything other than that story. And it was it was well published and well circulated uh, during the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it's almost impossible to trace that story. You had another great example in your book of where one of these strangers turned up at a local store and wanted a huge amount of lard and seemed to store it in this clear plastic sack of some sort and as Aaron mentioned just paid in gold nuggets it was one of the many stories that I've come across I should say another author which is uh, Dr. Harvey Spencer Lewis he was the one that wrote a book in the 1930s regarding these people in Mount Shasta specifically and that book became so popular and according to him these mis these people left Mount Shasta because of the publicity. Oh. Because these maniacs started flooding Mount Shasta, started shooting their rifles into the wilderness, um, throwing bobs into caverns to try to capture a Lemurian. So according to him, they, they fled in these like these blimp like airships. Right, right. At that time when they were supposedly leaving the Mount Shasta area, there were other reports of people seeing these airships like around Los Angeles specifically, even in the border um, during a, a lightning storm, some of the lightning reflected off one of the blimps and they thought it was some type of invasion. And so the, the army started shooting 
at the blimps and that was the last we heard of him a lot of the lemurians are just like well there goes the neighborhood <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> gotta get out of here but you also mentioned uh you know this in one of these cave stories with the mummies that the discoverer was reminded of freemasonry and in fact uh churchwood believed he had found a link between these legends of lemuria and freemasonry as well what were those connections and did you find the same things yourself the, the best example that I could think of is that same Native American author from California. Back in the early 1900s, she was describing her Native American tribe as having a secret society, which was almost exactly the same as the Freemasons. So accor- according to her, they have the same source. They have the same source in terms of the, the lodge, the, the way things work, um, the master of the lodge. And these teachings are... Change, they change over time. However, they have this origin. Civilization X is a perfect name for the documentary because it looks like a lot of this information does point to at least some kind of advanced uh, world culture that existed in the past. So we'll keep our eyes out for the release of the documentary and we're excited to hear rumours that you're working on another book. Is that something you can talk about yet? Uh, I could talk about it a little bit. Um, I've been working on it for on and off for two, three years uh, with another well-known author. Um, his name is Martin Olson. He works for the Disney company. He actually got in contact with me through my website. He read my website and liked my stuff. And yeah, so we got to meet up in um, the Walt Disney studio a lot and he showed me around and we've been communicating back and forth constantly about this book, but we still have yet to finish it. He just recently published one of his books called The Encyclopedia of Hell because of his new book on uh, the Adventure Time Encyclopedia because he does one of the voices for that cartoon show. Oh, really? <laughs> That's yes. great. Which character? He's not Lemon Grab, is he? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> his, his real life daughter is uh, Marceline the Vampire Queen. Oh, right. Cool. Well, uh, Fernando, thank you so much for joining us and we'll keep an eye on uh, your projects and you, you've always got a welcome spot when uh, you want to come back to MU in the future and we'll definitely let you know if Aaron and I are in the jungle one day and we fall into a tunnel and find all these mummies and jewels you will be the first person we call well I did but the Australian government stopped me Big thanks again to Fernando for appearing on the show. His website is propheticmystic.com. You'll find links to his work in progress documentary there as well, Civilization X. And we'll link to his book in the show notes. It's The Ancients, Investigations into the Lost Civilizations of Lemuria and Atlantis. Now, I enjoyed the book and Fernando's research is quite balanced. The book is really just a collection of everything he's discovered over the years. Yeah, it provides a new perspective really on some of these ancient legends which have just been around for so long. And I like it how he points out that there might be something to this. And then he also points out that, look, this is just being blown completely out of proportion. Well, a good example was he was writing about the Dogon tribe and how they allegedly have knowledge of the Sirius star system. But what a lot of researchers leave out is the fact that when scientists followed up on that claim they found it to be untrue. Yeah, but that that information's never put forward in the legends, is it? So he does provide both sides of the story and connects the dots that he's found over the years. So again, mysteriousuniverse.org, look for season 11, episode 6, and we'll link to Fernando's work in the show notes. Now, coming up after the break, we have a story which kind of ties into the theme of the interview. Filmmakers are starting a new project and they believe they may have found Montezuma's treasure in Utah. That's coming up after this. Stay with us. 